I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Tom Sheehan. The title that I've given my talk goes under the name Data Trumps Theory. And um, if you've ever played bridge, you know what trump trumps mean there. And what essentially I have to say is that data is the overriding and ultimate arbiter of any theory there could be. So let's see. There's a basic rule in science that absolutely dominates everything. Any theory you can possibly think up has to conform to the data or else it'll be dismissed. Uh, the great Richard Feynman uh, said famously, it doesn't matter how smart you are or how beautiful your theory is, if it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. And um, you're supposed to say wrong with a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> However, that's the cornerstone of science. That's what the scientific method means. And it's been true for centuries. Okay. Long, long ago, thousands of years ago, Aristotle, on sort of a uh, philosophical viewpoint, said that a moving body tends to come to rest. And that was plausible at its time. Uh, because he never thought about friction. Didn't occur to him. Some 1,600 years later, about, or AD 16, Galileo went out and did measurements. That was unusual. It used to be you just believed philosophy. But Galileo did the experiments, took data, and showed that Aristotle was wrong, which is a perfect illustration of the fact that data is superior to theory. The law of inertia was composed by Galileo, which, which is that a body in motion stays in motion with a constant philosophy unless it's acted upon by a force. And with a slight change in words, that's what Newton's first law is. Now, more recently, it was widely believed about the year 2000, uh, sorry, 1900, um, that classical mechanics was perfect, and it described everything, famous line about if you knew the position and momentum of everything, you could predict the entire future of the universe. But around 1880, discrepancies started to creep in because they couldn't find the way light behaves. Eventually, it was noticed that the idea of an ether was impossible, and space and time actually contract. So for high speed particles, you needed an improvement, and that was what came along with um, Einstein's special theory of relativity. Uh, eventually, that was generalized, the general theory of relativity. But astronomical observance, observations were what was driving the demand for a new theory. Eventually, we, and today, we now understand gravity as the curvature of space-time. That sure wasn't the case around the year 1900. But we have improved the theory because we need it to fit the data. Um, now, this is attributed to Mark Twain, but nobody's quite sure if that's true or not. A famous aphorism, it is easier to fool a man than to convince him he has been fooled. And you'll see uh, later on that that's what we're up against. The important lesson that we have to keep in mind is that no theory is ever final. You can't have a final theory. Yeah. Always subject to corrections, always, always, always. New data, if it shows a discrepancy, has to be taken into account. So that a new theory is supposed to encompass the old. Now, the same thing holds true in other fields, not just in physics. Chemistry, does anybody remember phlogiston? You have to be a historian of chemistry to remember that one. Biology, DNA now, since the 1950s, explains genetics. But that wasn't always the case. We have had, in the last half century, some tremendous computer-aided advances. Um, the, have these intractable problems that you can't do with either pencil paper or a slide rule or anything, but computer models will do it. And I give some examples here of uh, CT scans, magnetic resonance, a few things like that. The proper use of a model is to test a hypothesis. 
Okay, and that's something that's very, very important is you have to have proof. And in particular, you have to validate any model you think up. And the way you validate a model is by comparing it with the data. If you go into the business of trying to predict the future, you're in grave, risky territory because you don't have data for comparison. And if a model doesn't apply, how are you going to know that ahead of time? Contemporarily, there are uh, a tendency to make predictions. And this is not just climate, but uh, a lot of things. You are at risk of falling in love with your own model. The ancient Hindus had the idea that idolatry is to confuse your model with the real thing. And people do that. You fall in love with your model, and you forget that reality is more complex than any model you can possibly dream up. So the future brings about what we'll call the test results. The future tells you whether or not your prediction was any good. And I noted there, if, if you know, in a situation in your model, the crash test dummies get killed, nobody minds. But if you're dealing with real people in the real world, you can make uh, erroneous predictions that result in terrible um, uh, consequences. So you really, really have to uh, uh, make sure you validated your models. So <clears throat> there have been um, various examples of these terrible consequences. There was something about 1972 called the limits of growth model, and nobody knew at the time of the existence of the mathematical condition called chaos. Chaos wasn't really discovered until 1984. But what was going on in this famous uh, model, the limits of growth, was in fact chaos. It was coupled nonlinear differential equations that dealt with things like human um, population and disease and all kinds of things, food supply, et cetera. They put them all into this big computer model, mixed them up, and came out with some numerical results. And in one case, they got lucky, and they used that forecast to assume that they were going to have a stable population 150 years hence. But it was all nonsense, because they didn't understand chaos. But however, and this is a very big fact, the UN went ahead and made policies affecting the distant future based on that model from 1972. And they didn't understand the chaos either, and these policies, many of them are still in effect. So. If you uh, try to model the contemporary climate, you get into, uh, we all know of the greenhouse effect. It's been known since 1859, John Tyndall. But uh, specifically in 1979, the Charney Report set the basis for all the modern models. They said that CO2 was the control knob, that CO2 is what determines temperature. That was a fundamental assumption, but they, uh, it was basically an adaption, adaptation of uh, weather prediction models. Well, <clears throat> you had by this time some pretty big fancy computers made general circulation models in the 90s and so forth. And as you got more and more powerful computers, you got fancier and fancier models. But the water cycle was ignored because they had placed their emphasis on CO2. And that continues to be a problem in the models to this very day. The reason they ignored the water cycle it was just too hard to calculate. There's water, there's clouds, there's all this heat transfer and everything going on, too tough to include, so let's leave it out of the model. Huge mistake. We're now at a point where the IPCC, if anybody doesn't know this, they're split into three working groups. Working group one deals with the science. Working groups two and three deal with what's gonna happen and what to do about it. But our enterprise here in this group is always focused on the basic science. They had these representative concentration pathways, or RCPs, and the reason they did this was to standardize the models between other models. They could compare each other by choosing these RCPs. So they devised, I think, along about uh, AR4 or AR5, what they called 
CMIP, Computer Model Intercomparison Project. But instead of comparing the models with data, they compared them with each other. Let's find a consensus, never mind the data. Another huge mistake. And that has created pressure upon contemporary modelers to not stray very far. Because if you do get a result that's far from the consensus, you basically are shunned, banned, canceled, ignored. Public policy, meanwhile, causes a great deal of fright. It causes people to be afraid. People are worried about um, what's going to happen next, etc. But what happens is, of the four scenarios, they deliberately chose one to be too small. Good idea. It makes a boundary, a guardrail on the side. They picked two that kind of made sense and were plausible. And then they picked one to be too high for the same guardrail reason. They wanted to have something outside the range of possibility so that all the models would stay well inside that border. But when they reported the results, they reported all four of them. Well, the journalists and the public didn't know anything, so they just latched on to the most draconian and horrible one, which was the one that was outside the realm of possibility. And they made headlines out of this, they got a lot of attention, caused worry among the people, etc. And that's something that has persisted to the present day, too. But here's what happens. John Christie showed this picture in 2015 uh, to Congress and got some attention. The red line is the average of lots and lots, 102 climate models. But the serious data, which the model should have compared with, is shown by the green and blue down at the bottom, which has to do with balloon and satellite measurements. And that's another example of overlooking your duty as a scientist to stick within the scientific method and to actually compare your model with the data. So, why is there climate alarm? Well, it's that media distortion. You don't get a headline, you don't get above the fold unless it's alarming. Politicians, they haven't got any technical acumen. So they pass laws against CO2 because the hype and so forth was telling them to get rid of CO2. We have student protests. Greta's name comes to mind. Businesses have caved in to meet the demands and promise such and such to the leaders of the, uh, the uh, movement. And all of this alarm was totally unnecessary and pointless because the IPCC recently realized that all this stuff was getting out of hand, climate change has turned into a secular religion, and the idolatry that I spoke of before is believing that the models are the reality. Again, a huge mistake. The attempt by the IPCC in the last few months to curtail this alarm has a limited amount of value because the word hasn't gotten around yet. But what they did was they made it clear to anyone who would listen that RCP 8.5 was too high and it's not to be used for predictions. And the remaining scenarios, RPC um, 4.5, 2.8, or 6, whatever it is, they don't give you a cause for alarm. They don't make any headlines. So there's a big industry out there of people drawing an awful lot of money from government grants mostly that hasn't got anything to do anymore. Well, these people find that it's best for their interest to not pay any attention to what the UN IPCC just said. So the next question is gonna be, how long is it gonna take for this news to penetrate all these barriers that are put up artificially? Um, there's an aphorism by, attributed to Mark Twain a century or so ago that goes, it is easier to fool a man than to convince him he has been fooled. And this is exactly what we are up against now. In trying to oppose climate alarmism, we are trying to tell people that they have been fooled. And there's a lot of resistance to believing that. Um, the persistence of UN commitments to this very day, based on that old report, The Limits of Growth, is an example of this. 
And it's really a shame that this is being allowed, but it's the way public perception works. So to correct these deficiencies, we have to, everybody, not just we, we, the, uh, the whole public, everybody, has to realize the deficiencies that are inherent in modeling. The input assumptions are what always drive a model, and those just cannot be perfect. You never should think that one parameter, such as CO2, can control the entire climate. It's too complex. You need to consider alternate causes, like sun output, albedo, etc., and just realize that any computational effort that goes out into the future may well become chaotic. So it behooves you to include dissenting information inputs. If we're going to restore the scientific method, we have to remember that data is supreme over theory. Every model needs to be validated against the data, not against consensus. And a lot of data is now available from recent sources. We've got balloon data that's over half a century, about two thirds of a century. We've got satellite data that's over 40 years. So it's possible to now make these comparisons with data. So thank you very much. And I think you will hear in the next speaker, Corcaden, a very interesting story about a specific error that is in the IPC models that deserves our attention. Thank you.